Look at someone and say, God is good. All the time. God is good. Praise the Lord. Let's just raise our hands. Almighty God. Almighty God. Just begin to tell him you love him. Tonight is your night. Oh my God. We invite you into the house tonight. We invite you into the house. Shakala batata sata bababasaka. Oh, break through tonight, Almighty God. Break through tonight, Almighty God. Lives are going to be healed tonight, Almighty God. Break through tonight. Shakaba rababasata rabababasaka. Ibabasidia rababasaka ya. Father, we have learnt this week of our rightful position that is with you in the garden, in your presence. As we saw this morning, for Ezekiel, the heavens open, and he was taken in to your very throne room and there received his commission there he received dominion and because of Christ and the work of the cross tonight almighty God we have dominion we have dominion I want you to touch your sickness where you've got it in your body. And I want you to begin to say, I have dominion. I command you to get out of my body right now. That is what we have, church. We thank you for it, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost, that when God put us in his hand... You came and you took us and you brought us to our assignment. We are here to be full of you, Holy Ghost. For those that are not baptized in the Holy Ghost, tonight is your night. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Almighty God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Before you sit down, look at the person next to you and say, the job is not done yet. Now look at the other person on the other side and say the same thing. Hallelujah. We've only just begun. You may be seated. What a privilege to be able to share God's word. What a privilege it is to fellowship with you, to worship with you, and to share God's word with you. I want to open a passage, but before we get to it, we're going to have an introduction. And the passage I want to open tonight, it's about the journey that we are on. And how we walk that journey. And that is the importance of what tonight is about. So you can put uh, Luke chapter 22 and verse 43 and 44 up. But before we read it, let me give you a journey of Christ. Christ, the Son of God, Philippians chapter 2 tells us that he emptied himself of deity and came to this earth born of a virgin. And then we read in his journey that at the age of 12, he went missing from his parents 
and sat and debated uh, with re religious leaders for three days. But look at the person next to you and say, his job's not finished yet. For we see that his parents came and collected him and then for the next uh, 20, uh, not 17 years, I should say, he, 18 years, he remained faithful at home. But then began his ministry. And he began by selecting 12 disciples. We see that he was baptized in water. And when he was baptized in water, it tells us in Luke chapter 3 that the Holy Ghost came upon him. Who today is baptized in the Holy Ghost? Put your hand up. Baptized in the Holy Ghost with speaking in tongues. If that's you, raise your hand. Not everyone. Tonight is your night. But even though he was baptized in the Holy Ghost when he came up out of that water, his job was not done yet. And at the very same moment, we read that the Father spoke from heaven. So the Father had observed the life of his Son and was well pleased. Bishop was telling me the other day that he went down to Nairobi and saw his son. And his son and others had formed a group and they were meeting. And it made him very proud. But the son's job's not done yet. The son's job's not done yet. So then he went forth and he was... Uh, led by the Spirit, and he went up into the mountains where for 40 days he, d he fought and defeated the devil. Surely this is it. He's defeated the devil. Surely now he can go back to glory because his job is done. Or is it not? Yes, he defeated the devil, but he didn't defeat the devil on our behalf. So he's in the mountains and he's spending time with his father and he's fellowshipping with his father. And so surely then he could say, well, look, I beat the devil, God, uh, uh, Dad, and, you know, I'm up here with you and I'm having great fellowship with you. Can't I go home now? And God looked at him and said, son, the job's not done yet. And so he went back and he began to preach and minister and he began to raise the dead. He began to heal the sick. He began to cast out demons. Uh, and so he reaches the point now where he's 33 years of age. Surely he's done everything possible to do. He's defeated death. He defeated nature. He walked on water. He commanded the waves to stop. Surely now he can say, the job is done. But no, there was still more for him to do. So we come to the last few days of his life on this earth. And he's in the upper room with his disciples. Uh, and he begins to break bread with his disciples and he gives them a piece of bread and he tells them and they've never heard this before but he tells them that when you eat this wafer you are eating my body and when you drink this cup you are drinking my blood it's not what some churches say representing my blood is literally, spiritually drinking it. So surely at this point, we now have the bread that we can take a communion and that bread tells us that we will be healed. We now have uh, the cup uh, of juice uh, and when we drink this cup of juice, uh, that tells us that all of our sins are washed away. Surely at this point, Jesus' job is done. But there was still 
a path that was required. Because this was a, a prototype. It wasn't the real blood of Christ that mingled to the ground. So we come and we're in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Luke chapter 22 verse 43 says this. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. Why does an angel need to come and strengthen the Son of God? We read, if we went back to earlier verses, we would read that in the Garden of Gethsemane, he took uh, Peter, James, and John with him. He took them aside. He says, wait here and pray with me. While I go and pray. But that whole journey, that whole journey from the upper room out to the garden of Gethsemane was like no other journey that the disciples have been on with Jesus. He didn't talk with them. He didn't uh, teach them. He didn't correspond with them. It was like he was carrying a heavy load. It was like he was burdened down. And it tells us that he was so burdened down that after he left the Peter, James, and John and gave them instructions, that he walked just a little way and collapsed on the ground. The burden that he was carrying. And in that moment, he said, Father, I've done it. Take me home. But the father's words came ringing back, son, the job's not done yet. And so he cries out in agony and he cries out and, and it tells us that he prayed for an hour. And then he went to see Peter and the James and John and they sound asleep. And do you know in heaven it says that Christ is interceding for the church? But when he goes and looks, the church is asleep. We think the job is done. We've come to church, we've got saved, we think the job is done. But while we think the job is done, the enemy is busier than ever. Take, for example, the West, which I've mentioned a few times to you. The enemy has dug its claws in. I heard today in a story or a sermon I was hearing an illustration, and I'd never heard this illustration before, but it says when a bird lands on the wire, it locks its claws around that wire, and that's why it never falls off. And until it releases that claw, he will be safe and secure on that wire. And that is what Satan is doing in society today. Laws are being passed against the church. Opposition is running up against the church. Why is the West or the world opposing Israel right now? Because it's all to do with God. It's all to do with you and I. And so he's there and he's in agony. And so this verse, it says, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. He's now getting desperate. He's now crying out to God with every ounce of breath that is within him. And so being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then, surely this is it. Then he sweat became like a great drops of blood falling to the ground. You see, surely this is it. Because in Genesis, God created man from the dirt. He formed him, and then the Holy Ghost breathed life into him. So here is Christ now, with a mandate from God. And so as he's in that garden and he's bent up in agony, crying out to God, and it becomes so intense uh, that he begins to sweat drops of blood on the ground. 
the drops of blood that hit the ground, the ground where man was formed. Surely this is it. Surely he doesn't need to go any further. The word says that he shed his blood for us. Well, he's already done it here in the garden. But God looks down and he says, your job's not done yet. So let us go across to John chapter 17. And in John chapter 17, we now reach the point where Christ had got up from the garden. He had gone down and uh, he was, had the encounter with 600 soldiers. See, Satan needed 600 soldiers. And even those 600 soldiers fell to the ground when Christ said, I am, I am, I am, I am. And so now in John chapter 19 and verse 17, it says, And bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. So now he's been whipped and beaten. His body's been torn apart to fulfill scripture. See, this was part of his job portfolio. Isaiah prophesied it 700 years before this. And so now he's carrying the cross. And it's so heavy, so burdensome again that they have to get someone else to do it. And so he reaches the place where they begin to put the cross up and they nail his hands and they nail his feet. And when he began to talk or say something, like when he said to John, this is your mother, mother, this is your son, he would have to lift himself up on that cross. Uh, and in doing that, he would be in agonizing pain. But he did it for you and for me. But even here on the cross, his job was not done. So then in verse 30, we have those powerful words that have probably had more pens put to writing sermons about this word, these, this phrase than any other. And again, this time he lifts himself up on that cross and with the last breath that is in his lungs, he cries out, it is finished. Surely this is it. I've said it. It is finished. Now I can die and go home to glory. But the father looks down. And he said, the job's not done yet. So we know how the story of Christ went. And so that he died and they put him in uh, the cave and they went there three days later and he was not there. And then, of course, eventually he went home to be in glory. And he looked at the father sitting at the right hand of the father and the father looks at him and the father says these words. The job's not done yet. Even though you're back in glory, you've still got a job to do because you're the head of the church. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20, says, tells us this. But I want to change tunes right now. And I want to go to a character in the Bible that teaches us a lot about the job's not done yet. So go to Acts chapter 9. Now we know that Acts chapter 9 talks about the salvation of the Apostle Paul. Or Saul as he was known in Acts chapter 9. And how that he was persecuting the church. Uh, and how that on the road to Damascus uh, he has an encounter with Jesus. You see, the job's not done yet. See, every person in here that knows Christ as their saviour. Christ has come down to you and he says to you, uh, he says, the job's not done yet. I'm still working. 
I'm getting my disciples. I'm raising my army up. The job is not done yet. And so the Apostle Paul gets saved and goes back and he waits in the, uh, the street called Straight. Uh, and Ananias comes and uh, anoints him and he gets his sight back and, uh, and uh, he gets filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, and so is that it for him? Let us read from verse 20. Immediately, this is Paul, immediately he preached the Christ. Where? In the synagogue. And the place where they now hate him. He preaches the gospel. He wins and creates a little church gathering. And the people, the religious leaders get so upset. Verse 21 says, Then all of them, then all who heard uh, were amazed and said, is this not he who destroys those who call on the name in Jerusalem? And has he come here for a purpose so that he might bring them bound uh, to the chief priest? But Saul increased all the more in strength and comforting the Jews who dwelt in Damascus. But they were ready to stone him. So the followers that were there, they took him and led him down over the wall so that he could escape. But something happens. Paul, he disappears for three years. Does that mean that his job was finished? Where is he? You know, he's the bright star. He's the one we all want to get in our church. Uh, the one who was a Pharisee, uh, who was going to be the high priest one day, is now a believer. We want to book a revival with him. With him. Where is he? In three years, he never preached a sermon. Was his job finished? He was with God in the desert for three years receiving much of the mysteries that we read of in his passages in the Bible. Now, after three years, he comes back forth. Does he begin to hold campaigns? No. He goes straight down to Jerusalem to see Peter. There he begins to share. And then we see the birth of his ministry. And so let's go to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 22. Are they Hebrews? So am I. See, people were criticizing. When we're going to work for God, when we're going to say the job's not done yet, People will begin to criticize us. People will be against us. If you want to work for God and you want to be a general in his army, then there are going to be those who are Christians even who will oppose you. And so here we see that he has to defend his uh, calling. He has to defend himself. And so he says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labor, more, in, uh, more abundant, in stripes, uh, above measure, in prison more frequently, in death often. From the Jews five times I received 49 uh, stripes uh, minus one, three times. And so we could go on and on and on and on. Surely after all this, his body can take no more. They say he was only a small man. Surely he would have been left with limping and bad issues because of all the floggings. Look how many times he received the whip. And those whips weren't whips. They had uh, stones in them and nails in them that dug into the body. Surely he can say... I've had enough. 
My job is done. But God looks down and he says to Paul, the job is not done yet. Many of you have walked a path in, the, in your Christian walk. And many times you felt like giving up. And every time you felt like giving up, God has looked down and he said, the job's not done yet. I know people in Africa, in Zambia, in Kenya, in Australia, you all know them. And they were on fire for God. But something happened. They had the whip once too often. They were in prison once too often. They were misunderstood. They were accused of things they never did. And so they said, that's it. And so they walked out. Do you know I could fill every church in Australia with backslidden Christians? Don't need revival. Just the millions out there that are no longer going to church, that once went to church. And do you know what God is saying to them every day? The job's not done yet. And they've ran and rebelled. One year later, the job's not done yet. Five years later, the job. See, God is patient. The job's not done yet. Oh, they've lost five years of productive ministry. But God doesn't look at that. He looks where you're at right now. And he's saying to you, the job's not done yet. So Paul decides, well, if the job's not done, I better just do it. And so in Acts chapter 16, where we'll remain for the next two hours. Amen, Amen. good on you. <laughs> Let's go to uh, chapter 16, verses 5. Now when they had gone through, oh, we can have got there. So when they had gone through Frigura and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden. Surely, now this is it. The Holy Spirit's not even letting them preach the gospel. You see, not everywhere is ready for the gospel. If we're going on a mission, it may be in your workplace, but they may not be ready yet. Because the Holy Spirit's got to go before us. He's got to get the hearts ready. I stopped on the aeroplane flying here and I was on the plane going to Dubai and there was this man sitting there next to me and uh, he was a Scottish man going back to Scotland and I began to share the gospel with him and he said, I'm a Christian. He was religious. But I was able to sow into his life, show him the difference between religion and Christianity. I get to Dubai and I'm sitting down in Dubai and I'm sitting on the concrete because where we were going to load the plane, uh, they didn't have chairs until you got inside, but they keep you outside until they're ready to let you inside. <laughs> so we're sitting down just on the concrete and this lady with a child sitting next to me on the concrete and so we begin to talk and she's from Zimbabwe but lives in New Zealand. And so, but she's a born-again believer. I'm fire with God, going to a great church there. So we begin to share about the gospel and so forth, and the husband's over a bit. And so he joins us when we sort of get inside and we're sitting down. And so he begins to talk, and, and he shares with me, God's given me visions. And he's, he was a, an engineer, and so he got hurt, and God started to show him visions to, to take his skills into schools. And to teach him in the schools. And so then it got so popular that he began to do classes after school. And so it's just beginning to open up for him. But in this conversation, he's had two visions he shared with me. In this conversation, it came up that he didn't like the church that they were going to. And so he's become spasmodic. 
he's become, well, I wish my wife would see it my way and just come to another church. In other words, run away. And so I was able to share with him. Because the job's not done yet. And so I was able to show him uh, that if God is loving him that much that he's giving him visions, God sowed a little seed in me. And so I said to him, I said, do you know a match, a little match? I said, the little match is a piece of timber with a red bit on the top. And I said, even if you burn it and it doesn't light, it embers. I said, if you're in the church and you don't like it because of their songs they're singing or whatever it is, I said, if you're in touch with God, I said, you may only be an amber. That means your job's not done yet. But I said, if you're burning, and a match really can't do a lot, but if you're burning, I said, if you drop it outside in dry grass, all of a sudden, hundreds of acres are burning. So I said, if you're nothing more than a match in that church, you're God's instrument, so your job is not done yet. And he repented and said, you're right. And so here is Paul. So tried to get into these places and couldn't get there. And so God leads him on and so he begins and he, it, there was two places he couldn't go to that he tried. And, and then one night it says, verse 8, So passing through Mystra, they came down to Taurus and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man, a man, a man of Macedonia. His job was not done yet. He had another assignment to go on. So they start heading and the journey goes and it's quite a long journey that they went. And so he begins to travel on this journey. And when he reaches uh, into Macedonia, verse 13 says this. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the river side. Now, why would you go to the river side if the vision said you're going to a man? Because who's going to be at the river? The women. Where are the men? Generally at the gate. So why would they go there? Because the job was not done. You see, to get to the man, he had to go through the women. Now, I guarantee there's a lot of men in this church that are here because of the woman. The most spiritual people I know in Australia, in Africa, in Kenya, in India, everywhere is the woman. Aren't you? Yes. That's why she's the prophet and he's the apostle. She has to pull him up every so often and say, Thus saith the Lord. Amen. Sit down or I'll give you a backhand. <laughs> I'm glad he said hallelujah. I may get to preach tomorrow now. <laughs> On the Sabbath day... We went out of the city to the riverside where prayer, wait a minute, if we're having a prayer meeting, where's the men? Where's the men? Oh, that's women's work. That's why the women are the more spiritual. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple and lived in the city of Thyatira who worshipped God. So she was already a believer. So imagine travel all this distance meeting a woman who's already saved. 
That's not what revival is about, or is it? And so we know the story goes on and Paul begins to establish a church. They're meeting in her house. Uh, and after a little while, this young maiden begins to follow him uh, who is demon-possessed. Uh, and, and she follows him for days until Paul gets angry and casts the demon out. And of course, this then upset the ones who owned this girl. All of a sudden, they had lost their income. So God was saving the women. God was setting this girl free, plus many others, I'm sure. But now, all of a sudden, Paul again is about to be beaten. He's whipped and beaten and cast not only into prison, but in the inner dungeons of prison. So they seized Paul and Silas and dragged, the, dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. Go to verse 20. And they brought them to the magistrate and said, these men being Jews, and they've got it wrong already, because they weren't Jews. Well, they were, but they were more than Jews. These men being Jews, exceedingly troubled. It's interesting how the devil, you know, in Australia right now, as I've told you, the government is trying to bring in laws to restrict um, religion and so forth because they're saying the church troubles our system. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. When the church troubles Satan, we're doing something right. Let's go to verse 21. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Again, lies, you see. This is how the enemy operates. They're all based on lies. Then the multitude rose up together. You know, it's interesting that probably some of these multitude were with Paul a moment ago. But all of a sudden, they turned. See, it's the difference between a Christian and an observer. We have a lot of observers in churches. Rose up against them and the magistrate tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. Now I remember as a teenager being beaten with rod when you're sent out of the classroom. Put your hand out and if you happen to pull it back, Gobs up the other way. So you never pull back. <laughs> Those rods, they hurt. And Paul was beaten. In fact, we will see later, if we get there, that the jailer ultimately had to patch him up. That's how bad he was broken. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them secure. Having received such charge, he put them into the inner prison. He put stocks around their feet. Surely now our job is done. Surely we don't have to do any more. Surely we can sit back and just have a bit of a gripe here and say, Woe is me. God, you gave us a vision. And we obeyed you and we traveled miles and miles fulfilling this vision. And we get here and we begin outreaches and people are set free and people are saved and now we're in jail. How many times have I heard that from Christians? Oh, things are going great. But then our child gets very sick. Where's your God now? Test our faith in times like that. I mentioned this morning we prayed for a young couple in our church that's going to have a baby on Tuesday. And they say that the brain is not growing. So there's a good chance. They wanted to abort the baby, but the parents said no. There's a good chance outside of a miracle which we're believing and demanding that that baby could die. 
Now we've been holding weekly prayer meetings via Zoom with this couple. And they've been very strong. And I don't want to put any dampener here. But I use it as an illustration only. But if that baby was to die, how will the parents be? That's the question of our faith. Now I don't comprehend that. I believe the baby will be living and will have a perfect brain. And medical have been proven wrong many times. Let me go over. Down to verse 25. Paul and Silas are in this jail. And it says, at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. What do we do when we're going through the darkest moments of our life? Do we say, Silas, you've got a better voice than me. So you start me off. That's power. Power. He touched me. And they went from one song to the other song. And they're having a powerful time. It's so powerful that their voices, they must have been like Africans. Because it just echoed right through the whole prison. Let me have two chairs up here, please. Bishop and First Lady, come up here. And at midnight, you see, the, the guard made a mistake. Look at your partner and say, the devil makes mistakes. He thought he had Christ, but he failed. He thought he had Paul, but he failed. He thought he had Peter in jail, but he failed. The doors opened up. And here is Paul and Silas. They're in prison. You know the mistake he made? Who can tell me the mistake that Silas made? I mean the, prison, the guard made. Who's gamed? Come on, have a go. Hey? They did not shut their mouth. Good point, but it's not the one. Someone else? Come on, you're saying it. Say it louder. You're probably right. Ah, that's it. You see, two puts 10,000 to flight. Two puts 10,000 to flight. If it was just Paul and he was in this jail and Silas was over in this jail, it might have taken a few more hours. But they just began to sing. Their chains on their feet. Paul's back is, is in agony and so is Silas for he was beaten as well. And then they begin to sing. They begin, I'm waiting for you to sing, Paul. <laughs> I'm waiting for you to sing. Perhaps we better have a singer around them. Have we a singer here? He's still God in the valleys when things go wrong. That's it. Come on, let's join them. Yes. Yes, Jesus. Yes. You see, let's stop there for a moment. You see, in our daily walk, our job is not finished. But the enemy will try to stop us. So this verse says, But at midnight Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisons were and the prisoners were 
listening. You see, the world sees us. When you go to work, the world sees you. When you're in traffic, the world sees you. You know, I was in Zambia with the, one of the pastors and I'd never met a more gracious man in all my life. Everywhere we went, he would stop for people to go, especially in Africa. You just push your way through. But no, he would stop. And it stood out. I picked it up. Such a gracious man. Suddenly. Say that, church. I love preaching on suddenly. I love the suddenlies in the Bible. Because that's what it's all about, church. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake. So that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately the doors were open. And everyone's chain was loosed. Man. I think it's an amazing thing that the chains fell off, but the building didn't fall down. The doors come open, but the di building didn't fall down. The guard, he gets his sword out, ready to kill himself. Go to 28. But Paul called with a loud voice. See, Paul had a word of knowledge here. Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm. We are all here. See, when you sing in your trials, when you sing at your darkest moment, I know people that suffer from depression. And I say to them, when they come out of it, and I talk to them, I say to them, try to worship God. In the thickness of your depression. I know it's hard because it's warfare. But that's what Paul and Silas did. They worshipped God. And the doors came open. The chains fell off. The guard came out. That guard became the pastor of the church at, at Philippi. And do you know in all of Paul's journeys... We never read of any of the churches he, he started or established or made stronger giving him finances except Philippi. I'm sure that guy left that position as guard that night, took Paul home, they were baptized in water, then he became the pastor. Then Paul began to write to him. As I close, God is saying, the job's not done yet. The job's not done yet. You've been hurt. That's your prison. The job's not done yet. Next year or the year after or next week, you'll be hurt again. And there will be periods where you'll go through uncertainty and not know where to turn, even like Paul and Silas. But the voice of God will come down and say, the job's not done yet. Father, these powerful leaders, again I anoint them tonight. I thank you for them. I thank you, Lord, for this extra word for them tonight. Uh, and Lord, let that word always ring in their heart. Uh, the job is not done yet. Hallelujah. But what about you? Some of you right now are going through a dark period. The job's not done yet. Are you ready to worship and praise God? If that's you, stand up right now. What about you? Are you going through depression right now? The job's not done yet. Learn to worship God in your depression. Have you got hurts? People have done things wrong to you? The job. Yes, he touched me. Good song. Yes, reach out to him, church.
something Almighty God and all that's on that touch my soul. Something happened and Almighty God, sing it again. Almighty God, begin to touch him. Begin to touch him, Almighty God. Begin to touch him. Shalaba Rabba Baba Saka. Iba Basada Baraba. Oh Baba Sadaba. Oh Basakaya. Oh yes, Almighty God. Almighty God. Oh something happened. And now I know He touched me and made me whole. Oh, He touched me. Oh, He touched me. Yes, Almighty God. All of us are kaya. That hurts my soul. Yes. Yes. And now I know He touched me and made me whole. Look at me for a moment. One of the curses of COVID was the outcome of depression and anxiety. Most of our young people, since COVID in the West, in Australia, the highest suicide rate is our teenagers. Many that I know, including my own family, some of them are suffering from depression, the outworkings of COVID. I curse it. It's a demon from hell. So tonight, as we're about to close, if you suffer from depression, if you suffer from anxiety, I want you to come out the front here because we're going to break this thing. Hallelujah. Make your way. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Just stand along the front if that's you. Yes, come on. Yes, come on. There's more yet. Come on. You young people, how are you handling it? How are you coming now, young people? Oh, he touched me. And all the joy that floods my soul. Something happened. And now. Look at me, you people out the front. Say this out to me. I have dominion. I am a child of Almighty God. I have dominion over depression. 
I have authority over depression. I have authority over anxiety. My eyes are fixed upon you. My job on this earth is not finished. In Jesus' name. Now what we're going to do, we're going to grab your wife back up here. Come back up. I want you guys to go together, Paul and Silas. Lay your hands starting there and I'll follow you behind. Go together, hold hands and then put your hand on them. Because with two, the prison shook. With two singing, the foundations of Satan were broken. With two people rejoicing in their darkest moment, Satan was fleeing. Hallelujah. Yes. And now I know. Jesus' name. Command it. Thank you, Lord. Breakthrough. 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 Shaka Baba Sata Baba Baba. Baba Baba Sakaya. Oh, he touched me. Breakthrough. We set you free right now. 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 Look at someone and say, He touched me. Amen. Let's lift our hands. If there is joy in your heart, raise your voice.
if you didn't hear your neighbor's voice, I want you to help them to celebrate. Would you confirm with your neighbor if they are touched like you? Tell them you have some joy. I'm very serious. I'm looking around. If you are not celebrating, you have not been touched. So I'm calling you here until you are touched. So I want to see how many are touched through their celebration. I'm watching. is prophetic. What does that mean? When a word is spoken in an atmosphere like this, you, you don't wait. You, you see as you grow in God, you grow like a baby. But you get to a level of maturity where you know the voice of God. That when a prophet says it's a season for harvest, although it's a planting season, you own that word and begin to expect and behave and prepare for harvest. If a prophet says, I see people flying, you go straight and get your passport. If, if a prophet says, I see you building a guest house, you, you, you begin by preparing your next room as a guest house. If a prophet says, I see this church becoming a Bible school, you begin to organize for another venue for the church. But you see, when you're still a baby, you still depend on brother the Lord is saying specifically to you, I'm going to take away your soul. That, that is good, but that is for babies. A prophetic church picks every word as a prophetic word and personalize it and run with it. Maskia toa mungu. Eh. Ukisha kwa na maskia ya kinabi, neno lolote li nasemwa na nabi, iwa natabiri directly, ama ni maubiri, ama maneno yake, ni maneno yako ya kinabi. Unachukua na kukimbia na. So I'm sure we've picked those words. Do you believe those words are very prophetic to you as a person? Do you believe they are prophetic to you as a person? Yes. So listen, pick that word and run with it. When it says, I hear the Lord is saying there is a grace flowing, you just pick it as a prophetic word and run with it. You are not like, Lord, if you are here, speak to me directly. He's actually speaking to you. Speaking to you. Now, ukisikia mungu amesha kukutoa katikati ya watu na kukuangelesha mbele za watu, manena ambao ni yako pinafsi na manisha weni kichongumu. Ukisikia mungu mbaka anasema maneno yako mbele ya pasta yako na strangers, wewe ni kichongumu. Mbaka mungu atangase, adharani ndio kesho akikukonga kuna washuda. 
So mnataka gani yenye unasikia Mungu ama mwenye Mungu anakutangaza barabarani? Hebu nilisia jirani yako umesikia Mungu ama unataka kesho uitwe jina na isemekane ulikula nini? Tabia. God is your father. His word is a directive to you. His word is his will and desire for you. Have you received a prophetic word tonight? Yes. 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 I used to have a brother who used to tell, who used to say every time we go to a conference, he said, if the Lord really wants to call me, let the man of God call me from wherever I am and prophesy to me and say exactly my name. He has never. I told him whatever God is saying, even if he's talking to my neighbor, I capture. Listen, beside Prophet Tom who came and directly spoke to me, and I know why God spoke to me very loudly because he was new to me and I was a bit stubborn. So God had to say it openly so that there are witnesses. Throughout my life, I never had a prophetic word. I remember I went to a man of God and I told him, what is the Lord saying about me? He told me the Lord is saying, go back to school. <laughs> so I never had a prophetic word. I never. But you know what? I believe when God is speaking, it's prophetic. I pray that we mature, that, that, that we don't wait for... You, you see, you see, do you realize the issues God calls specifically are those issues that has oppressed people? Somebody is contemplating suicide. So the Lord is actually, you know, calling out of a resolution that is negative. Or depression has caused you. But a man who is a conducive environment, good soil, when the word of God is sowed, it falls on good soil. I pray that you're good soil. So are you going to work on those prophetic words? Amen. So I don't want anybody coming to me and say, what is the Lord saying about me? He has just said. Unless you are stubborn. Good. In, in 30 seconds. Ebu mwambia jirani yako mungu wa mesema ninu kuhusu wewe. Na jasema utawalewa, yu utawalewa tupila mungu kuhusema. Ebu ulisa jirani yako. I want everybody to tell your neighbor what have you heard the Lord saying about you. Pastor Oliver, you better do it. I am going to ask your neighbor what you told them. If you are not talking to your neighbor, the microphone is coming. Talk to your neighbor and get an answer. I will pick two people here, two people here. Hey, security, close the door. I want to hear what is the Lord saying. Have you heard something? Are we ready? Now listen, I'm going to pick two people here, two people here, two people here, and two people here. Nobody going out. Security, close the door. Are you ready? Can I hear the two people here? If there are no two people, I will pick four. The first one, what did your neighbor say the Lord is saying about them or to them? Yes. She said that the Lord has healed her. That's good news. Number two. What did you hear from you? So both of you lied to each other. Okay. Yes, my prophet. Yes, this one told me he's a prophet. This one told me he's a prophet. Yes, sir. He said the work is, the work is not done yet. That's good. You can repeat what the prophet said. Yes. At least you heard that one. Yes, two people here. Mose, seriously. Mose, Mose, Mose. Is that what you heard the prophet saying? No, he didn't say blow the trumpet. Yes. Number one. So all of you are lying to each other the way you are talking. Okay. I'm coming back to you. Here. Yes. Two are better than one. Oh, yes. Yes. Now, now, I, that, that someone was powerful. You realize even when I was called up here, I was writing. The word was coming to me. The one that they were chilled together. The devil is stupid. He would have put... Paul and Silas in different jails. But he put them in one and jailed them together. And the Bible says two. Good. Somebody has heard what the prophet is saying? If your neighbor didn't hear anything, you know who to avoid in church anytime. Because if you can't hear and your neighbor can't hear, and the Bible says two are better than one. And the Bible says two will put 10,000 to flight. Then there is a problem. Both of you are on flight. Anybody else?
Shetani ashindwe. Pande hii What did you hear the Lord? Yes sir. Even in times of trouble sing hymns and praise to the Lord. At least there is a wave of praise and singing in the praise team. The only problem is it's not coming from the praise team members. It's coming from a stranger. Anybody else? What did the Lord say to you? Why are you acting like you don't understand English? What did this boy tell you? He said the Lord is saying to marry her or to marry him. So what did he say? That the word he had during the crossover when we were crossing into the new year, the word was the work is not done yet, so it is personalizing assignment. So it's a confirmation. Good. The elders on this side, I know you've been in the spirit. Yes, elders, the 24 elders, what did the Lord say? At our rate for Mukuskia frequency. Let's pray for this side again. Pray for this side. Yes. L- listen first, church. If you didn't hear anything, you heard love. If you didn't hear anything, pick up your Bible and get a verse, a phrase, because that's God speaking. So you may be still on that journey. But let me say over here, (laughs) somewhere here, there's a business person. She's right here. She's right here? Right. God's about to bring a new wave. A new wave. A new wave. A new wave. In fact, we have dominion. So if you are a business person, raise your hands. A new wave is coming. 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 Let let me say this. Never be embarrassed to talk about God. You know, on Sunday morning, if I could, there would be two things I would take back. The first one would be the first service. When I was overcome and began to cry, I wouldn't take that back. But I held the mic here. And I watched myself online and I sounded terrible. But God used it. God used it. Now listen, this one's personal. The second one I take back is I've told Mike many times, I never preached the same sermon twice. But because it was a word for the church and I did it last time, I did it again this time. And I blew it. I blew it. So it's okay. Because that's the grace of God. So did I run away and hide? No. The work is not done. Doesn't matter who we are, church. So I've made a covenant that when I come back, I'm not allowed to preach twice the same message. (laughs) And I've right. Najaka nina furai. Na furai kwa sababu amuku sikia neno la mwisho kwa ile message ya pili. Na mkasema amen. Mungu awabariki sana kwa kufunika mtumishi wa Mungu. Thank God for a fatherly heart who has rescued you from my terror. I was going to keep you here up to midnight until I get what I want. But the father has come and say you had love. So may the love of God keep you. Amen. Amen. Are we blessed tonight? Tomorrow we are here for lunch hour. And then Friday we are here for lunch hour. Unfortunately, we still have Prophet Tom only for two days. Some of us thought it was a long time. We only have him tomorrow, lunchtime, and Friday lunchtime. On Sunday he will be preaching somewhere else. Next week he will be in Kericho, and then he will be back to Australia until next year. Can we be here tomorrow lunchtime? Be here on Friday? And guess what? It's not just a prophetic quote. It's a prophetic environment. You can pick a word in a prophetic environment. 
And the Bible says every prophet carries a reward. So it might not just be the prophetic word. It might not be just a prophetic environment. It might be a prophetic reward. Some of you, there are things you've been waiting for. Maybe the Holy Spirit will drop into your spirit during this season. Make a commitment and come. Bring somebody. Are you feeling one of the things that the Lord is doing is lifting burdens and giving us joy? Are you feeling that joy and excitement? It's like the river of revelation is becoming very easy. And I, I, I pick something. I, I think the Lord is taking us into a dimension of the flow of grace. You realize in this church, we have never preached from the book of Ezekiel and Revelation. Did you realize it's understandable? I've never had even Pastor Oliver quote even by coincidence. But did you realize Ezekiel and <laughs> Revelation is flowing today? The only time I've had people preach on Revelation is when they are talking about remember your first love. Especially when you mess up relationships. But, but there is a river of Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Revelation. And that is prophetic. Now it takes a prophet to interpret such scriptures. If you are an evangelist, please focus on Zacchaeus and the tree. Yes, Lazarus and the rich man. But if you are a prophet, go to Ezekiel and Revelation to understand what a man with three, f I mean four different faces means. Yes, when an animal has a face of a lion and a lamb at the same time without becoming a witch. You, you know what I'm talking about. Amen. Package your offering. We love you, man. We love you, man of God. Please package your offerings. Package your offerings. Are you able to celebrate something? Because I, I realize these guys also are very prophetic in their singing. They have to really pray to pick a word. Our jamaa wa meimba tangu wa saliwe. Lakini bado kiwambia wa imbe wa nashanga. Tu imbe nini? That tells you this thing is not experience. There must be a prophetic action. Na onanga sa sgine Simon Rosa, Simon Rosa na stama and ina confirm. Iki tu siyo sauti. Siyo experience ni mungu. Ata ile wimbo anajua. Sa sgine anachoma mba sana. Kuchoma nafanya nini? Kuchoma. Kwaribu. Iliona saa wale wali situliwa lunch time. Aka realize kumbe al... Alijifunza kuchesa hiyo drums kwa kuchesa ndarama. Ile ya boba. Chukwa sataka ni wabariki. Amen. You mwamba, yes, you mwamba. You mwamba, yes. Lord, with our giving tonight, we honor you. We accept the environment. We accept the season. We receive the word. We receive the prophet. And so we receive the reward of the prophet. With our giving tonight, even as we shake our hands, like our culture is, let there be an impartation in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 As the praise team are giving us their own number, their own number, it doesn't.